Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Rendezvous in Russia by Lauren St. John. So this is a Laura Marlin mystery by the winner of the Blue Peter Book Award. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, Lauren St. John was one of the first in authors I interviewed for my book blog, socialbookshelves.com. So this was back in like 2013 or so. And um, yeah, I've just seen some of her books in charity shops throughout the years, and so I thought it was cool to go ahead and pick them up when I could. And um, I do quite, quite, I do quite enjoy them. I mean, um, so this one is like a middle grade uh, sort of detective series, I suppose. So I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and share some of my tabs as I go along, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Accidents do have a habit of happening, Laura Marlin, especially if you are of a heroic disposition and put yourself in harm's way. When Laura Marlin's Siberian husky, Sky saves an actress's life, she and her best friend, Tariq, receive a surprise invitation to spend time working on a film set in St. Petersburg in Russia. But what promises to be the coolest holiday ever quickly turns deadly as a series of accidents threaten both cast and crew and Laura finds herself at the centre of a lethal game. Could art be about to imitate life? So we get this reference to the Dead Man's Cove, which I, uh, I'm pretty sure I've already read that one. Um, Laura couldn't repress a shudder. Tariq was speaking from experience. Barely six months earlier, he and Laura had come close to dying at Dead Man's Cove, only a stone's throw from where they were standing. Even now she could feel the power of the sea as it had sucked at her, trying to drag her into its freezing black depths. Um, what Lawrence and John is really good at is writing about nature. Um, so animals in particular, um, I think she's like vegetarian, she has um, you know, like a strong animal conservation message throughout her books, um, but also the planet as well. This here is a needless stereotype, and um, I don't know how old this book is, um, 2013, so arguably should have edited it out by then. This would have been coming out, this was maybe what she was promoting then when, she, when I interviewed her. Um, but yeah, the line here, chapter 2, Anna Maria's mother, who was Colombian and quite excitable at the best of times, fainted. I just don't think it's like uh, a necessary cliche to throw in, I suppose, because it's not a helpful one, you know? And basically the dog sort of saves the hero and so then we get this little twist of, of fate here. Um, but I just thought it's interesting the thought process because it's quite believable to me. Um, so uh, yeah. It turned out that the cameraman had not stopped filming when the director shouted cut but had recorded the entire drama. Do you know what that means? Brett demanded. It's movie gold. Pure movie gold. With some judicious editing we can use the entire sequence in the film almost as if Kay had written it like that in her screenplay. Laura was taken aback. But what about Anna Maria? She could have been killed. Surely she wouldn't want that footage being seen by movie audiences. Brett Avery laughed. On the contrary, she'll love the publicity. Mark my word, she'll get an Oscar for that performance. He put a hand on Laura's arm. Which is where you come in, my dear. I must have your hero dog for my movie. Obviously, we couldn't use any of these scenes if we had to find a replacement dog. We could get another husky, but it's unlikely we'd find one with three legs. Besides, this particular dog is the exact dog I've been searching for. A dog with attitude. A dog movie audiences will adore. I want to buy him. How much will you take for him? And she's like, nah, mate, you're not, you're not buying my dog. Okay, some more Lauren St. John thoughts. I'm trying to be quiet because it's currently late at night. So Andre took a deep breath. Do you know that there are films which are said to be cursed? I've never heard of a movie being cursed, but I've just done a school project on Egyptology and that involved a curse, said Tariq. When the archaeologist Howard Carter opened Tutankhamun's tomb in 1923, loads of spooky things happened. Almost everyone who was at the opening of the tomb later fell victim to accidents, unexplained illnesses and even deaths. Andre was impressed. I actually worked on a documentary about Tutankhamun, so I'm familiar with the stories about an ancient curse sent to destroy anyone who disturbed the boy king's tomb. Our research proved that almost all of them were conspiracy theories. I mean, Carter himself died of old age. The only really creepy story is the one about Lord Carnarvon, the man who financed the dig. He was bitten by a mosquito during the opening of the tomb. The bite became infected and he fell seriously ill. At the exact moment that he passed away in Egypt, his dog in England gave a series of blood-curdling howls and dropped down dead. And um, yeah, that did apparently happen. Uh, Carnarvon as well, he used to own the land that my grandma's house is on. I thought this was an interesting point. Um, the director of the film says, I don't care if he says that your great aunt Bertha resembles a whale, you grin and bear it. William Raven pays our salaries, at least his, mu at least his movie producer brother does. Mr. Raven is a man of, how shall I say it, great sensitivity. 
As it is, I'm going to have to do some fast talking to prevent you being fired. If you upset him again and he walks out, the movie is finished and 156 actors, extras and crew are out of work. Do I make myself understood? And that's kind of the point that um, PewDiePie always makes when he talks about Scare PewDiePie being cancelled, where it's like he's less disappointed for himself and he's more upset for all of the people who worked on it and who made it happen because it had all been edited and was ready to go and then just got shelved. We have another mention of Egyptology here. I just sort of picked these up because I'm really fascinated in it myself. So we've got Laura loved art and had been looking forward to seeing the Hermitage as much as Tariq had, but nothing could have prepared her for its epic scale or for its treasures. Vladimir's monologue had them gasping and laughing as he guided them expertly through the four historic buildings that made up the part of the museum open to the public. Each was more magnificent than the last, although Laura's favourite was the Winter Palace, once the state residence of Russian emperors. She also loved a Van Gogh painting that seemed to move as if a great storm was brewing in it. Tariq was fascinated by the Egyptology section, which had hieroglyphics, mummies, and a statue of Pharaoh Amenhemat III, who'd lived 2,100 years BC. Uh, we have this moment as well, um, this guy's making a copy of a painting and she touches it and the paint was still wet and she leaves like a very tiny smudge and you just know that that's going to come up later on, you know. I thought this was quite deep, especially for a kid's book. Fame is overrated anyway. All it means is that people take photographs of you in your swimming costume when you're looking really fat and put them on the front covers of magazines. I think I'd rather be poor and obscure. And again, this is 2013, but I think uh, this is very telling too. Still apt. Laura's opinion of the Deputy Prime Minister took a further dip. He seemed a thoroughly obstinate, egotistical and inconsiderate man. With people like him running the United Kingdom, it was hardly surprising that the newspapers were always complaining about the country being in a mess. This was also again quite deep. What's nepotism? asked Tariq. Sounds like a disease. It sort of is. Essentially, it's when a relative or a family friend or connection gets you a job you would never have got otherwise and probably don't deserve. And again, someone says here, um, Everyone loves a hero, don't they, he said in his soft, firm voice. What a shame it is that real life can't be more like the cinema. On the other hand, the conflicting sides of human nature, light versus dark, are what keep things interesting. And that's very true. And of course, we get this line as well. Um, he looked like a film star, said Tariq, who was wearing a white silk shirt with a wide blue collar beneath a black suit. Actually, no, you look more like a musician. There's a folk singer called Laura Marling. You look a bit like her. And all the way through when I was reading it, every time I saw Laura Marlin, I thought of Laura Marling. We get this little fun bit. Um, Laura and Tariq were banished to the far corner of the gallery by Jeffrey, who sees them the moment Kay's back was turned and told them that, in his opinion, children on set should be unseen and unheard. I'm not sure you mean what you think you mean, Laura told him. Your grammar is a bit twisted. It's a bit like Inigo Montoya. We get this bit. Why ask a question and then walk away without waiting to hear the answer? Laura helped herself to a chocolate biscuit from a plate near the coffee urn. Because he enjoys toying with people. It's not personal. According to Matt Walker, that's what politicians do. They're sort of like cats. Occasionally they'll be nice to other cats, usually because they want something or because the other cat has sharper claws. But most of the time they prefer to play cruel games with creatures much smaller or weaker than they are. It amuses them. And then of course we get the moment where uh, Laura's looking at what should be the real painting, but she notices that there's no smudge there or well, there is a smudge there, whatever it meant that it meant that the paintings had been switched. And then just this last little passage I wanted to share here. Her theory is that fame is like a bubble. It looks gorgeous on the outside, as if it's been painted with pretty colours, but when you pop it there's nothing there. She said that life, love and friendship are what matters, and that what you do is more important than what you show. My uncle agrees. He says everyone loves a hero. So yeah, all in all, I did enjoy a Rendezvous in Russia. I've enjoyed all of Lawrence St. John's books that I've read so far, to be honest, and I've read about five. Um, this one, probably in the top third or so of them. Um, I just quite enjoy the Laura Marlin series. It's very cute. It's like ideal if you've got kids, but also, I mean, I like murder mysteries, so or mysteries of any uh, genre. In fact, that's kind of what I like about the, this, is, is that the, there isn't any murder. Um, it's a mystery. <laughs> So yeah, 3.75 out of 5, I think. So there we have it. That's what I made of Rendezvous in Russia by Lawrence and John. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.